Well, good morning, everybody. This is Chip Rogers, President and CEO of the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Thank you for joining us on what is the latest in our forum series as we bring you leaders from around the nation, both inside and outside of our industry. Um, it comes as no surprise that what we have faced since the pandemic has been troubling and challenging for everybody, for particularly those of us uh, in the area of hospitality. Today, you're gonna to hear from two outstanding leaders as we begin to look at what leadership means in a time like this. And I'll introduce those leaders in just one second. But before we do that, I wanna thank our sponsors. Obviously, without our sponsors, none of this uh, could be possible. They make this forum series um, a, a for us be, to, uh, to be able to bring it to you. And as you remember, um, as we move through the next few months of recovery, um, and you and your business make decisions, always keep in mind those who are willing to support us, especially during the most challenging times. Now today, again, is a very special uh, program. We're very excited to have Chicago's Mayor Lori Lightfoot join us and Mark Koplamazian, who's president and CEO of Hyatt Hotels, headquartered in the mayor's great city of Chicago. Now, as this summer leisure season comes, sadly, to a close, uh, some of the greatest challenges that our industry will ever face are right in front of us as we move into the fall season and we are not seeing the pickup in, in business travel and of course conferences and conventions that we hope and that we need. The urban markets in particular have been hit hardest and hit longest. In fact, if you look at the most recent uh, numbers from STR, you see that the occupancy rate last week among urban markets was 42%. Same time last year, it was at 75%. And Chicago specifically has been hurt. Uh, in fact, the urban market of Chicago and these, uh, the SDR numbers from last week had occupancy at about 37% compared to the same time last year at 79%. So all of this is hurting industry, it's hurting families, it really is hurting those individuals who work in and around our neighborhood. And certainly it's hurting the city of Chicago. We'll talk about that in, in just one second. Of course, on top of all these challenges that are both economic and medical, we also have the issues of social unrest and the things uh, that are surrounding injustice in our country. And we're grappling with that at a very difficult time. The city of Chicago, uh, no stranger to this. In fact, over this last weekend, there were demonstrations in Chicago and the mayor and her team, I'm sure she'll talk about that in just a minute, uh, seemed to handle that almost perfectly. And we, we want to thank her for her leadership on that. And so as we look to all of this, um, we'd like to bring you the leaders that are actually making a difference. You know, if there's one thing you need in a crisis, Clearly, it is leadership, and Americans are looking for leadership, whether it's in their family, in their communities, in their jobs, uh, or among their elected officials. Uh, mayor Lori Lightfoot uh, became the mayor of Chicago last year after an historic election. She has taken an, un undertaken an ambitious agenda in expanding opportunity and inclusive economic policies to help grow all of the city of Chicago, and we want to certainly thank her for that. She has come into office at a very challenging time, uh, even before the pandemic. She helped close a record $838 million budget gap in her city, as well as key investments in education, public safety, and of course, financial stability. Um, she is working at all levels of government uh, for inclusiveness and helped continue to build uh, the incredible reputation that the city of Chicago has, uh, especially around enhancing public safety uh, and overall safety uh, during this pandemic. Mark Koplamazian is the president and CEO of Hyatt Hotels. He's certainly no stranger to any of us in our industry. Um, he was appointed to this position back in 2006, previously serving as president of the Pritzker organization. He serves on many boards in and around our industry, and he also serves on the board of the Aspen Institute. He's a member of the World Travel and Tourism Council. And most importantly of all, we are thrilled that he will be the chair of the American Hotel and Lodging Association beginning next year. So first and foremost, Thanks to both of you leaders uh, for joining us on this leadership series. We appreciate your time today. Mayor Lightfoot, uh, we're gonna start with you. You've had a lot of firsts in the fir a first historic election in taking this position as the mayor of one of America's truly great cities. Uh, and you've had a year, which I can't imagine you could have possibly prepared for. Um, tell us what it's been like. Uh, what are some of the surprises you've seen? What are the things you're happy with? And what are some of the challenges you've seen moving forward after your first year in office? Well, thank you, Chip. I mean, obviously, there's no playbook for coming into office, facing a record deficit, a teacher strike, and then a global pandemic, and then on top of it, uh, civic unrest in the streets. Um, but I think the thing that's served us well, um, and I think any, anyone who aspires to leadership understands this, is you've got to have a great team. You've got to have a team with vision, with fortitude, 
um, and the ability to adapt to an ever-changing environment. Um, nothing that we've experienced, particularly over the last six months, um, anybody could have predicted. And uh, we've endured, I think, more challenges than any city normally would in a generation, let alone in a six months time. And the thing that I know has sustained me as a leader and really kept me going is the strength of the team around me. Yeah, teams are absolutely uh, critical. It's, uh, you know, we see these great leaders and they always talk about the team around them. And then when you get in a leadership position, you realize, wow, you know, as good as I can do my job, if I don't have an excellent group of people around me, um, I'm not going to be successful. And, and I appreciate you mentioning that because it does certainly take a team effort to navigate the incredible challenges that you have faced. Uh, Mark, you are obviously the CEO of a global uh, hospitality company, but it's also high, well known for its headquarters in Chicago and being a Chicago-based uh, organization. How have you handled uh, this pandemic? How has your team handled this pandemic? And, and what is your perspective in, in running this global organization out of a great city like Chicago? Thanks, Chip, and thank you, Mayor Lightfoot, for being with us this morning. Um, like the mayor just described, this, uh, you know, this year started off without any uh, hint that we were going to have unprecedented decline in demand, uh, which went very close to zero uh, in April of this year in the United States, but uh, we, saw, we saw it cascade across the globe. So it's been an extremely challenging time for sure. I think um, I'll echo what the mayor said, uh, which I loved, uh, which is you need a phenomenal team around you in order to be able to manage through it. At Hyatt, I would say the other dimension that's served us extremely well and has been essential is our own um, purpose. Uh, that is a, per a higher purpose that we aspire to, which is to care for people so they can be their best. And that purpose has actually been our guiding light, our North Star, as we have managed through what has turned into a significant adjustment, a reduction in force uh, in, our, in our business, um, and also many other steps that we've had to take in order to ensure that we have a long, um, a long future. Um, I would say that uh, there are a few dimensions that um, I think are particularly important. Um, on a personal level and for, on behalf of my colleagues, I have focused on well-being and self-care as an essential piece of the equation. Yes, a lot of focus on the physical well-being aspects of, uh, you know, in relation to the, the virus, but also um, really being paying attention to mental well-being and emotional and, and psychological well-being. Um, so that's been an important dimension. Um, and, the, and the second thing that I would say is that there's definitely a focus on um, the community. I'm, I'm really blessed to be a leader of a company in Chicago. The Chicago business community is uniquely engaged and unified in helping, um, trying to help uh, the mayor and other organizations advance uh, the interest in Chicago. And like every other major city in the US, Chicago has um, had a significant number of challenges with respect to employment levels, with respect to the virus, and with, with, with respect to the economy. Um, and I would say that what the, um, what the effort around Chicago has yielded is a lot of connections to other business leaders, which has been very beneficial. Thank you, Mark. Chip, if I can follow yeah. up on the things that Mark said that I think are really important. You know, in, in this storm that we've all been facing, <clears throat> I think the thing that's been critically important for us, and I think Mark just spoke to it, is making sure that you don't <clears throat> lose your sight of your values. You know, it's easy when you're in a crisis to say the things that we thought we were going to be doing, the values that we espouse as an organization, those are luxuries for a different, easier time. And, and what we've been focused on is making sure <clears throat> that we keep our values, equity, inclusion, and making sure that we build um, literal wealth, but also emotional wealth across our city, that we keep those values front and center. It's hard to do. Um, and there's obviously price tags that are attached to all those. But if you, if you lose sight of your values in a crisis, you're gonna be lost. And when you come out of it, if you come out of it, um, you're going to have to start literally from, from ground zero, and you lose legitimacy both internally uh, with your people, but you also lose um, legitimacy externally with the various audiences that all of us are trying to reach. You know, city government isn't a business, but we still have different audiences that are important to us and making sure um, that we are engaging and leaning into those values and helping support um, our various audiences, whether it's individuals, 
neighborhoods, small businesses, but also our larger businesses. And I think the thing that this pandemic has underscored over and over again is how inextricably intertwined we all are to each other because the effects of this virus, the effects of an impact on our economy, showing our strengths, but also showing our vulnerabilities demonstrates, I think, definitively that we all have to find a common ground together and really be rowing in the same direction in order for us to come, all of us come out of it better on the other side. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, Mayor Lightfoot. And, you know, I want to talk about making sure that you're focusing on dealing with the problems of today, but also not forgetting the perhaps the larger context. And as someone who comes into elected office, you know, you certainly had goals and things you wanted to achieve that never contemplated dealing with a pandemic. So I want to talk about that just for a second. So you come into office, you have some really good ideas. One of those is invest south and west. And, and that's an an effort that you and your team have put together to make sure that you're addressing some of the areas of Chicago that perhaps have been neglected in the past or areas that are struggling even coming into the pandemic. Then you get the pandemic. And so I know it's tempting as a leader sometimes to move away from those things and those goals that you have to deal with the here and now, but you've been able to successfully do this kind of both at the same time. You're dealing with the pandemic on one side and all the struggles that come along with that, the social unrest that has hit Chicago and all the other major cities. And at the same time, you're successfully implementing a program like Invest Southwest. Tell us a little bit about that program, that initiative, and how you're handling both at the same time. Well, Invest Southwest was definitely born out of a lot of conversations that I heard uh, and had with people over the course of the campaign and then really the beginning of the administration, where we saw um, this great thriving um, downtown central business district, but our neighborhoods were starving. And what were the results of that? We were seeing a loss of population and really a loss of hope. People were leaving the city because they didn't feel like they could uh, really create a life here in Chicago. And ultimately, if you just wanna do um, dollars and cents, when you've got a shrinking population, you have a shrinking tax base. And a shrinking tax base puts more pressure on everybody else who remains. So while I think it was a morally correct thing to do, which is to really focus on building up capacity in our neighborhoods and creating vibrant neighborhoods in areas that really hadn't seen any city investment or private capital in a long time, it also made economic sense to me as well. So Invest Southwest was really born of that philosophy. And <clears throat> literally it is what it, what it says, which is uh, looking at 10 key commercial corridors on our south and west sides, um, that hadn't seen a lot of economic development, but really co-curating what that future would look like with indigenous folks on the ground in those neighborhoods. And while yes, we were slowed um, in the rollout of some of the things that we plan to do because of the pandemic, what the pandemic I think really um, showed us is the areas where we were vulnerable were actually the areas that we needed to lean into and develop even more expeditiously. So for example, and you, you know this, that um, the pandemic has been, uh, the virus has been particularly brutal uh, among people who have underlying medical conditions. Why is that? Because those underlying conditions, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, upper respiratory illnesses, those are the things that the virus um, really attacks from a physical, physiological standpoint and makes it much more difficult uh, for those people to be able to survive a sickness and come out on the other side. The 90 plus percent of the people who have died in Chicago from the virus have died um, with underlying conditions uh, and, and the virus just exacerbated those. So what that told us was um, the things that we knew that we needed to do to build a healthy, strong Chicago. And we've got a specific initiative with our Department of Public Health. We needed to accelerate those efforts. So, you know, we talked about Healthy Chicago 2025, but we really needed to invest in resources in those now. It all fits together um, as part of our economic development, our public health um, uh, investments, and other things that we're doing to build a healthy environment in Chicago. Um, so we really had, in my view, no choice but to really um, go headlong into these kinds of investments because that's what the need was that was so urgent and it became uh, very clear as we started to see um, the disproportionate impact of the virus on different parts of our population and city. Quick follow-up on that, Mayor Lightfoot. You know, as you, as you look at all of America's great cities, there, 
before the pandemic, there seemed to be somewhat of a disturbing trend. And I think you pointed it out uh, quite rightly in your efforts to invest Southwest. And that is your city center business districts seem to be doing quite well. Um, real estate became very expensive, but some of the very close surrounding neighborhoods were struggling. Do you have any advice for other, other mayors and other city leaders on how to tackle this since you're already tackling it? Well, look, I, I think you've got to look at, you know, what are your longer term objectives? And, you know, as I said, my, my goal still is to grow our city back to 3 million in population. That's an ambitious goal to be sure, particularly now, uh, given what we've been through for the last six months. But I, I try to play, as one of my team members says, I try to play chess, not checkers. And in playing chess, you've got to think strategically many, many steps um, down the road and continuing the status quo where we went long um, and hard in developing our central business district, but didn't spend the same kind of energy and resources and looking you know, just a little bit south, just a little bit west, we were seeing the consequences of that. We were seeing it in loss of population, um, emergency room visits, gun violence, um, all the things that you start to see manifest in neighborhoods where people are losing hope um, there where they don't feel like they've got a stake in their future. So I would say uh, to anyone who would ask, and I'm loath to give advice to anyone else, um, but for us at least, making these kinds of strategic investments, being present in a way that we hadn't um, in, um, in a quite a long time, I think gave people in these communities that were suffering a sense of hope, a sense of ownership. You know, we're not, we're not there yet. We've got a long, um, many more steps to go on our, on our journey, but I think it's manifesting itself in building goodwill because people feel like they have some ownership um, in their future. And, and just one last point of it, which is another trend that we're hearing um, and we're seeing across the country, this whole notion of defunding the police and public safety issues. People feel passionate about this issue because they see us spending you know, upwards of 40% of our city budgets on law enforcement, on policing, and not nearly the kind of resources that folks in struggling neighborhoods wanna see us investing. So when you don't support healthy, vibrant families and neighborhoods, and the only government actor that they consistently see is the police. And when the police are only interacting with folks from a law enforcement um, enforcement perspective, as opposed to helping uplift the quality of life in neighborhoods, then you have other problems that are cascading as well. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons to make these kinds of investments and see your city bigger than your downtown area. But at the end of the day, having people feel like they've got a stake in their own lives, that they've got a destiny that remains in a city like Chicago, you can't buy that kind of goodwill. But it just takes a little um, to tip it in the wrong direction. It takes much more, particularly over decades of neglect, to get back um, that legitimacy. But it, to me, it's critically important for our long-term future for us to kind of make these kinds of investments. We want the <clears throat> hotel association and your members in Chicago to be vibrant and thriving. We want people to think of Chicago as a, the great global city that it is. But we can't get there if we only see Chicago <clears throat> as a small geography and not the entirety of the whole city. That, that's a great point. You, you talk a lot about, about ownership and destiny. Mark, I want to, I want to switch to that and, and, and get your thoughts on inclusion because, you know, the beauty of America is that everyone should have, the idea is everyone should have equal access to opportunity. And yet there are so many in society that look at where they are today and they don't see that. They don't see the chances, as Mayor Lightfoot put it, to have ownership of your destiny. I know that Hyatt has done an amazing set, of, a lot of things around this idea of diversity and inclusion to create that notion that, hey, everybody is in. We accept, want, and desire all diverse thoughts, all diverse people, so that we can all succeed together. Tell us a little bit about that and specifically a little bit about Opportunity Youth, which I know is a program here at HLA that we focus on a lot. Thanks, Jim. Um, a lot of what the mayor said is uh, near and dear to my heart, um, both professionally and um, I would say in my community service as well. I'm uh, chairing, uh, chairing the board of an of a organization called Skills for Chicagoland's Future, 
which is focused on and dedicated to finding jobs for people who are coming out of disadvantaged uh, backgrounds or disadvantaged neighborhoods. And a lot of that is uh, focused on the south and west side of Chicago. We just opened, Skills just opened a new office on the south side, for example. Um, at Hyatt, um, look, we, we are a global company and we operate in every uh, possible imaginable uh, marketplace and, uh, and culture and environment around the world. And the diversity of our workforce is just uh, stunning to see, it's magnificent. And so too is the diversity of the guest base that we serve. So being in a diverse environment and being highly inclusive has been inherently a part of who we are and what our culture has been about since um, we were founded back in the, in the, in the mid fifties. Um, what I would say is we, we several, a number of years ago, uh, we focused very intensively around opportunity youth. These are young people who are either out of, uh, out of school and or out of work and trying to find pathways to bring them into the workforce. We believe, uh, as does AHNLA, through the opportunity youth programs that AHNLA has led brilliantly, uh, and through the foundation, by the way, which does incredible work, um, to actually identify pathways for people who don't have great skills or don't have significant skills, because we, as an industry, have many entry-level jobs that allow us to bring people in and then give them a career opportunity to train and learn and, and advance. So three years ago, we made an extraordinarily ambitious goal at, as a company to employ, to hire 10,000 opportunity youth by 2025. Um, very, very uh, lofty uh, goal that we set. Um, we were, I'm, I'm proud to say that we were on track uh, as of the end of 2019, when, during which time we, we employed about 2,000 opportunity youth across the world. Um, of course, COVID-19 has created a, a different type of challenge for us. Um, and our hiring levels are going to be, of course, back with us as soon as travel recovers. But if, for the time being, it's a, little, it's a little less than clear exactly what the profiles look like. As a company, um, we've really, uh, for, like many companies and many organizations, have focused increasingly on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion over the last uh, several months in particular, um, of course, in this period of time in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, there's been a tremendous level of focus and attention on it. And, um, and we've established a, an agenda, uh, which we, we're calling Change Starts Here, and it really is focused on three things. One is, who do we employ and develop as uh, individuals and professionals within Hyatt? Um, who do we support as organizations that are going to help the communities? in which we operate. We are very much focused on, and especially focused on Chicago and supporting organizations that are helping to support the communities in the South and West side in particular. And then the third dimension is um, who do we buy from and partner with? And that's more of a supply chain diversity uh, initiative. Um, what I would say is um, like Rise High, we as a company have um, almost always set extremely aggressive and aspirational goals. And DEI is no exception to that. The goals that we've established are very, very aspirational. Our theory is that we need to set the right trajectory and pathway for us to pursue, but keep our feet on the ground, recognize, as the mayor said, that there's a tremendous level of work that's required, that this will take time. And really, in addition to time, it takes perseverance and it takes resolve, which we have. Um, so I think that the evolution of bringing so many young people from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds into the workforce is a key part of that equation. And so too is the, the agenda that items that I just, uh, I just laid out. Mark, thanks. Mayor Life, but a quick follow up on, on diversity. You know, I, as I think about where we sit today and how important leadership is, it occurs to me that when times are good, sometimes it's easy not to focus on diversity because you think, well, nothing needs to change. We're just humming along here, everything's great. Then you face the challenge of a lifetime, and hopefully for all of us, this, this pandemic is the challenge of a lifetime, and you recognize that having diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of experience is absolutely critical to making it through something that you could not have prepared for. So how have you done that, and then how do you keep that going moving forward once we hopefully someday soon get past this and recognize that that type of diversity of thought and, and, and background and experience to any problem, bringing that to any problem, uh, will really help you become more successful? Well, there, there's a couple layers, I think, to your question. And let me give you 
uh, my, my, the context for my uh, answer. Um, but prior to becoming mayor, I was a lawyer at um, a large global law firm. And one of the various roles that I um, held there was the chair of diversity and inclusion. And when I started at the firm, we had an incredibly uh, diverse group of lawyers um, from the partnership ranks, um, senior equity, um, down to uh, the associates. And then the uh, recession of, uh, of 08 and 09 hit. And we had to make a lot of really hard choices as an organization. And that meant um, letting some folks go. The, the, the challenges, and this is, I will quickly say before I became in leadership on diversity issues, the challenge was that the, the, the choices that were made were done without regard to diversity. And as you well know, and, and I think Mark really spoke eloquently to this point, you can set very ambitious goals, but you can never take your foot off the gas. The minute you plateau and you think we're, we've arrived is the minute you start slipping back. And so um, what I know from that experience and how hard it is to get great diverse talent, which there's always a tremendous competition for, um, you've got to continue to be diligent. You've got to not only think about how do I recruit the talent, but also how do I retain the talent? How do I uh, build capacity and give people the opportunities to really grow uh, within our organization? Because what you also see at a lot of organizations is a lot of diversity at the entry level, but you won't see it at the upper uh, echelons and the, you know, so, so to speak, the C-suite. So what we've done here is to continue from the really, really start from day one saying this was really important to us. We've got to make sure um, that we have a, a lot of diversity of views, of backgrounds, and so forth. I'm proud to say that over 60% of my senior leadership team are people of color and mostly uh, women, which are, I think is a, is a, is a change for uh, a lot of administrations. But even with that, the other thing that we know is important is we've got to make sure that we bring other people into the conversation. So any major policy initiative that we think of, the first thing that we do is we identify uh, the major people who are kind of out there in the not-for-profit world, um, in the NGO world, and we start to engage them. Because even though we may end up at the same place in terms of the basic uh, outlines of a particular policy initiative, people want to feel like they are, they've been part of the discussion from the beginning of the journey, not at the end when the cake is baked and you say, here, um, would you like to take a nice bite? That, that <clears throat> philosophy of bringing people along um, at the start of the journey, really engaging with them, now that's messy. Um, it takes more time. Um, but, but the goodwill that you get from doing that, you just can't, you can't replace that. So we really not only try to do it internally and in making sure that we're speaking to all the relevant stakeholders, but also <clears throat> our critical external audiences. We try to do the best that we can to make sure we engage them on the front end, get their views, adapt, and then move together um, towards um, solutions. And let me just say one last piece on that. <clears throat> You've got to know where you want to go, where you want to end up. And I say that to say, in the world that we're in, people are angry, people are protesting, but they're not as focused on the end game and the solutions. And I think that's, again, another thing, lesson learned out of this last six months is you got to give people the opportunity to speak their truths, but you also have to focus on how do we build common ground? How do we move towards some concrete solutions that are going to be there for the long haul and not just pander to the crowd in the short term. Now, it's a little twist on your, on your question around diversity, but I think when you think about diversity of views and, and you think about incorporating other people into the discussion, you've also got to have a very clear vision of where you want to eventually get to. Otherwise, you're just going to languish in endless rounds of hand-wringing or um, angry um, conversations that don't lead to something positive. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, I think in this time, what people want is hope. They want leadership that inspires them. They want to feel like progress is being made. Uh, they, they absolutely want to feel like their leaders understand their daily struggles. Um, and I think that that is a, a continued incentive, and, but also an opportunity uh, for us as leaders to make sure in the first instance that we're listening, that we're learning, and that we're moving forward towards solutions. 
Thank you so much. That, that um, fantastic answer on making sure that diversity for diversity's sake is not the only thing, but diversity to find common ground and to reach at a common, understood, accepted, uh, and ultimately adopted set of, set of uh, action steps and goals uh, is absolutely critical. So I appreciate that. I want to switch quickly to uh, a, a real kind of look at how you work as a leader and what inspires you. You know, this is a leadership series and, and, and things that inspire people are all over the place. And I want to hear from, from both of you how you have dealt with this. And I'll start with you, Mayor Lightfoot. As I mentioned earlier, you come in an historic election. You've got these ambitious set of goals that you want to accomplish that, in fact, you are accomplishing. And then you layer on the challenges of the pandemic, social unrest, and everything that goes with that. How do you go home at night and say, okay, this is what inspires me, this is what supports me, and this is what helps make me do it? Because it's gotta be challenging sometimes when you wake up the next day and you see more bad news and you think, how can we possibly survive this? There's gotta be an underpinning driving you towards success every day. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, these last couple of weeks in particular have been extraordinarily challenging. Not that the six months hasn't been, it really has, uh, but these last couple of weeks where it feels like you know, one thing after another, after another, and, and, and mostly bad news. Um, I'm not gonna uh, tell you that I haven't had moments of despair in that time because I have. I think the thing that keeps me going is um, a couple things. One is I, I really do try every single day to have time for myself. Um, literally just headspace where, you know, I can just put the burdens of the day aside for a moment. They don't disappear. Um, but having that moment where I can just get clarity and feel like I'm centered in my own mind, and you mentioned this uh, tip at the, outside, at the outset, making sure that people are taking care of their uh, emotional and physical self, I can't agree with you more. It's so critically uh, important that we do that, and we do that as leaders. You can't just keep going seven days a week because you're going to lose your focus. You're going to lose a sense of of, of the moment that you're in. The other thing, the flip side of that is also really kind of blocking out a lot of the white noise. The thing that I, I knew before I took this job, but I certainly know it um, now in the last few weeks is, you know, when things aren't going well, and there's a perception that things aren't going well, everybody can do your job. Everybody can do your job for you. So you get a lot of unsolicited advice, and I'm sure it's well-meaning, um, but it's important to listen, to be sure, uh, be responsive, but also not lose your sense of self. The thing that got you to the point that you're in. Being flexible enough to be able to pivot when you need to and say, you know what, we tried this path, it's just not working, it's not resonating. We need to go in a different direction. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example of that. One of the challenges that we face in the pandemic is the continuing growing um, cases in our Latinx community. And we've done, a lot of different interventions. We've poured tons of resources into testing, to contract tracing, uh, uh, tracing to education, to outreach. Um, and we've been doing this really aggressively for uh, at least three months focused just on that community alone. And we're not making progress. And so I said to my team, look, I know we've tried all these things. I know we've done all these engagements, but we're not, we're not getting traction. So we've got to go in a different direction. So um, one of our pivot points is tomorrow, I'm literally physically going out into the zip codes that have the highest um, rates in the Latinx community. And I'm knocking on doors myself to bring the message um, to this community about what they can do to empower themselves to help fight this disease. And obviously we wanna bring a lot of uh, publicity to it, but we, you know, we have, we have got to think of more creative solutions and challenge ourselves and not just be content to say, well, we've done all we can. No, when lives are at stake, it's never enough. You gotta keep pushing yourself. The, the other thing that I will say that inspires me, going back to your question is, I think a lot about the children that I've met along the way and I care deeply for them. You know, it, it's hard for me when I see children in difficult circumstances to get into my fancy car and go home to my family and, and not think about them. I, I carry them with me. So even when I'm kind of at my lowest ebb, I think about the fact that I have a responsibility. They are, they are in my heart and I wanna do everything I can 
every single day, not only to be a role model for them, but to make their lives better. And the last thing I'll say is, um, it is uh, the inspiration that I've drawn from people who are sacrificing everything, who even in the most dire circumstances have no reason to hope, but they do. And I've met many of those people along my journey and particularly over the last couple months. I will, I will tell you when we, like a lot of cities across the country at the end of May and beginning of June, faced uh, tremendous looting that just destroyed whole communities and small businesses that were intergenerational, going around and, and surveying the damage. Um, I met so many people who had no reason to be optimistic, no reason to be inspired, no reason to believe that the city of Chicago continued to hold their destiny, yet they did. And so I think about those people often. I think about the children and I say to myself, no matter what I'm feeling personally, I have a responsibility and an obligation to them to rise to the occasion, to ch challenge myself to be a better leader, a more thoughtful leader, uh, to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to use the instruments of government to be a force for good. Um, so that's what keeps me going. You know, Mayor, I really appreciate your story about, about leadership and, and when something doesn't work, because sometimes things look great on paper, you can get it all mapped out and think that if we just do step one through five, we're going to be a success. And then you realize that sometimes it doesn't work out. And I, I remember discussing this with the mayor of Atlanta a few years ago, Kasim Reed, and talking mm -hmm. with him about, uh, you know, leadership is not leading people in the, in the wrong direction. It's recognizing that when you're going in the wrong direction, the ability to turn and lead them back in the right direction. So I, I sincerely appreciate that because it is so important because things don't always work out exactly as we planned and, and, and you gotta make adjustments. And, and your story about going and knocking on doors and, and changing what's happening in that community can only occur when you're willing to adjust. Um, Mark, I wanna to talk to you about leadership and, and a word that was used to describe you recently. You were in an interview and, and someone mentioned that you lead with empathy. Tell me what that means to you, but more importantly, tell me what that means in leading a business and how we can use empathy in helping to be leaders in a business setting. Thanks, Chip. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, our purpose as a company is to care for people so they can be their best. And we developed an equation, a mathematical equation, uh, which is that empathy plus action equals care. So in order to care for someone, you actually have to practice empathy. You have to understand where they are at, what their needs are, um, what their perspective is, and, and from what life experience uh, they come. And uh, actually the mayor talked about it beautifully a few minutes ago because um, a lot of the effort in the design for how you go about either dealing with the pandemic or dealing with the initiatives that uh, she has on the agenda, um, they, the approach is that inclusive empathy-based approach where it's co-creation and really understanding what's happening. I'll just give you one very specific example that's relevant to our industry too. Um, I was talking to our head of operations for the uh, Americas, and we were talking about how guests are responding to the, the mask wearing requirements that are now in place, and specifically in restaurants. Um, and what he said is that what we, what we learned through very careful practice of empathy and listening to our colleagues is that it's our colleagues that are more concerned about serving people at tables uh, where people are not wearing masks. So um, we started implementing a requirement where people, guests, patrons of our restaurants, for example, should wear a mask uh, when they're interacting with our own colleagues. Last week, the, the city of Chicago uh, announced a, a identical mandate. And um, so I was really proud to see that. And I thought that was a really smart idea. Um, we, we derived it from what we were learning from our own colleagues. So these are really, it's a really, really critically important time to practice empathy. And that same example can be applied uh, many fold over all the guests that we've interacted with, the customers that we've interacted with, and, and our hotel owners as well. So our whole approach and our whole philosophy of our culture is, is really centered around the practice of empathy so that we can care for our colleagues, our guests, and our owners uh, and, and make that happen. But I do think that um, the, the essential ingredient in that is to recognize that in this time, people's individual experiences are varied. People are under a lot of stress. And um, 
understanding that and being at one with it is um, essential to being able to figure out how you can help them be their best. So the clock waits for no one and we're, we're, we're near the end here. So I only have time for one more question. And I, I wanna take this question from kind of a, a story of hope and intertwine it with leadership. And, and Mayor, I'll start with you, but I'll give you an idea on a story that I had in my life many years ago. Um, I had the opportunity after a tragedy had hit my home state of Georgia and I was riding around with the governor of the state. We were in this SUV and the local sheriff was driving us around and we went through a mobile home park that had just been leveled by a tornado, absolutely leveled. There was no, nothing standing. And I'm thinking these folks are already uh, facing challenges in life that, that I probably would never face. And I can't imagine what they're going through. And now they've had the whole life ripped out and everything they own ripped out by this tornado. And this one young man was so excited when he saw the governor drive by that he said, hey, governor, you signed my license. And he held up his driver's license. And I thought to myself at that moment when that person's lost everything, they're just excited to see their leader uh, joining them and understanding what they're going through. And I know you, you sense that, you experienced that and seeing what's happened with the pandemic. Do you have kind of a story of hope or, or something that you've seen over these last four or five months that, that let us know that, hey, it's gonna be all right tomorrow? Yeah, I, I, I can think of many, but I'll, I'll share um, one recently. And it's, and it's akin to what you just described. Um, one of the things that um, we tried to do over the course of the summer, even with the pandemic, is make sure that our young people have the ability to be outside and engage in you know, healthy physical activity, obviously with all the social distancing and so forth. So one of the things that we, um, our park district has done um, is a program called Rolling Rec. Um, so Rolling Recreation. And they are taking um, activities out to neighborhoods where there may not be um, a park or there may not be a field house for young people. They do it on Friday nights. It's a whole community thing. Um, and we were out um, recently on one of these uh, activities and the, the neighborhood just responded um, so, so well. There were so many people that were out there, lots of different generations. Um, and uh, my wife and my daughter and I were there along with our team. Um, and I had um, the leader who was the president of the block club, um, who had really been the person that was engaged with us. And he kept saying to me, I can't believe you brought your family to here. I, I, I can't believe that you're all here. This is so meaningful. And the thing that I know from traveling, and I try to, and even in the pandemic now that we can be out about, I really try to get out into neighborhoods as much as possible, is people do want to see their leaders. They don't want to just see you on TV behind a podium. They want you to be out there. And not only, I think, is that a benefit for them, it's a benefit for me to really see what's going on in neighborhoods, to view it with my own eyes, not filter through, through staff or a memo. Um, it makes an enormous difference. Um, and it's kind of like what, when Mark was explaining with the, the mass rule, people want to know that their leaders are listening, that they understand what their daily challenges and opportunities are. And you can't get there if you're not there physically yourself. Now, I can't get to all 77 neighborhoods um, every single week, but I'm, I'm very intentional about making sure that I am out, and particularly I'm out in neighborhoods um, where it's important for them to feel like they've got some ownership over the mayor's office and that their mayor cares about them. And, and I can't tell you how much I've learned uh, from those experiences as well. And Mark, last question for you as well, a story um, that, that inspires you to let us all know that as bad as it seems today, that tomorrow we're all gonna be okay. Well, look, I think that the, the thing that, that has really moved me deeply uh, from the time that, that we had to make very difficult decisions to shut down hotels and furlough people, and then uh, unfortunately have permanent reductions in force, is the incredible humanity that exists in times of stress and, and strain. Um, we, we saw it with frontline workers. Uh, we reached out and, and tried to provide, um, we did provide friends and family rates to all, all uh, frontline workers uh, in, the, in the health uh, field uh, because they were doing incredible work uh, selflessly the way that Mayor uh, Lifewood just mentioned a minute ago. 
but even within, and especially within the Hyde family, um, the incredible level of care and empathy that's practiced every day. The, the question, that, the rhetorical question that many people, of course, use is, how are you doing? And in, you know, pre-COVID, that was, a, that was the pass off way to start a conversation or get into your business. Uh, but people mean it now and they, they, they pause and they take time to really understand and listen carefully. That's a practice of empathy. So I'm, I'm, I'm really inspired by what I see. We had a, a team of people, for example, uh, at the Grand Hyatt New York, which remains uh, suspended in their operations today. They got together, again, these are not people who are showing up at work every day as a team because of the care that one of, our, one of their teammates received at a local hospital, they got together and put together a offer at like a, a free stay and took it to the nurse who was principally in charge of the care of their fellow colleague. And that's extraordinary stuff. And, and, I, and I love that. And I think that it's actually definitional to who we are as a company, but also to who we are as an industry. And I think that that practice of humanity and that proximity and that emotional sense of connectivity is both going to uh, propel people to get back on the road and see their relatives and friends, but also it's going to help society at large. I think this is the, the, the heart with which people are engaging with one another is really notable and uh, magnificently inspirational. Thank you for that. Well, that brings us to the close. Uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and, and Mark Coplamese, and I, I can't thank you enough personally, and I know I speak on behalf of our industry and thanking you for your inspirational leadership during uh, a time when we probably need it the most. So thank you for all that you do and thank you for spending a few moments of your time here with us this morning. Um, none of this again would be possible without our sponsors. So we certainly want to thank them and um, make sure that uh, as you see them on the screen here, that you remember them the next time you're engaging to do business because they're supporting us at a time when it matters most. So again, on behalf of Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Mark Complamese, I want to say thank you uh, who have been with us this morning and please make sure to join us again on our next forum series, we'll have an announcement very soon on who our leadership guests will be on the next forum series. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.